On last week's show, there was a discussion about West Ham. Following conversations this week between the Sunday Supplement and the club, we apologise for any factual inaccuracies made on the programme. Recently published accounts show that West Ham have invested heavily in the squad since their move to the new stadium, with a net spend of £214 million in the last four years, including club record Sebastian Haller. They've spent over £1.5 million on scouts in the past year, and they've also invested £10 million in the redevelopment of the training grounds at Rush Green and Chadwell Heath. In response to the claims that the appointment of Stuart Pearce was vetoed by the board, the club say this isn't true. During the discussion, it was remarked that the club had a culture of everyone's got their hands in the till. This was a reference to the level of commitment of some players and managers and was not a suggestion of any illegality in any way. We apologise if this wasn't made clear. It was suggested during their time in charge of Birmingham City, David Gold and David Sullivan presided over no significant investment at St Andrews. During their time at the club, they invested in the redevelopment of the ground, including three new stands and 22,000 new seats. As a result, St Andrews has been awarded Asset of Community Value status. Sky Sports always strives for fairness and accuracy in our programming. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Supplement. Manchester United's transfer business is under scrutiny after they followed their deadline day last minute move for Odeon Igalo with a stalemate against Wolves. Frank Lampard maintains that Chelsea are underdogs for the top four, but who could potentially catch them? And there's takeover talk again at Newcastle United. Could it really happen this time? Joining me to discuss all of these topics and much, much more are Henry Winter, the chief football writer at The Times. Mike McGrath, football reporter at The Telegraph, and Craig Hope, football correspondent at The Daily Mail. Don't forget to tweet the show at Sunday Sup, and the best will appear on screen over the next 90 minutes. Jackie's away, so I'm back in the hot seat. And here's what we'll be looking at this week that's made the back pages this morning. A very, very familiar theme here, the Observer, touching distance. Historic 20th win in a row at Anfield puts Liverpool 22 points clear at the top. Um, quite a few have gone with this one as well. I'll go with the Express. Must be time to celebrate. Yep, we'll forgive them that one. Left of field here from the Sun, though, quite interesting. Italian Giants plot £150 million move, summer deal for Virgil van Dijk, Juventus. Well, that could raise some eyebrows. Um, over at the Star, they've changed their focus, if you like. City Stars facing judgment play. Big rebuild job in the summer, according to the star, with seven players playing for their future. Uh, reflecting on that stalemate that I mentioned at Old Trafford yesterday, Mirror have gone with Snorri, Snorri, Man United. Not impressing anybody. And again, we mentioned that transfer window. Down here, Jonathan Northcroft, um, he's written, and the headline on his piece is, United's chaotic loan move snubbed by Rondon. Elsewhere, we've got bubble trouble in the people as West Ham throw away a two-goal lead against fellow strugglers Brighton. Terrific win for Everton yesterday. Express, Theo steals in to nick it. And last of all, horrible, horrible moment for Palace's keeper yesterday, jaw dropping. So, good morning, gentlemen. Henry, I'll start with you. Manchester United... In focus, um, a move for Igalo, which I think surprised many in the game. What do you make of what is going on there at the moment? Well, I think if you looked at the, the game yesterday, um, they clearly need a striker. I think there's short-term and long-term issues here. The long-term ones in, in terms of the, the, the structure of the club, in terms of recruitment. And, uh, and Solskjaer and others within the club have tried to, uh, to address that. Uh, short term, they shouldn't have overplayed Marcus Rashford in, uh, in, in December. He played eight games in, uh, in 28 days, played something like 11 hours of football in, sort of, I think, 13, 14 hours that Manchester United played in that period. And he's such an important player, everyone knew he was carrying a, a, a back problem. And then it went to, you know, when, when he came on, was it against Wolves? So, look, big issues there, short term, long term, the chaos of the last 48 hours. Manchester United, one of the wealthiest clubs in the world, 
you know, with, with resources, you know, they should not be behaving like that. So scrabbling around, making late night calls, early afternoon calls to, uh, to China to see if they can get someone over. Has Gola actually had a medical yet? You know, there are issues there. And also maybe sort of one or two other issues with, uh, with coronaviruses and, and, and issues of a player coming in as well. Look, Manchester United have got good people behind the scenes, but this is a little bit embarrassing. Having said that, yesterday showed that they need a striker. They also need a clear out in the summer. You look at some of the players in that midfield, sorry, just on finally finishing off, Bruno Fernandes has come in. He looked pretty decent yesterday. He's what they need in terms of that creativity. Got a bit of character, he, you know, he, he got booked. I mean, there's a, there's a sort of strength of mind and, well, not so much physicality, but a strength of mind to him, which, which they clearly need. But they're individuals there who shouldn't be there like Fred and Perez, so they need a clear out as well as new players coming in. You say they've got good people <coughs> behind the scenes. Where's the evidence of that when you describe the chaos that's happening? Well, sorry, when I say good people behind the scenes, I'm not a huge fan of Woodward. I think the... But Woodward represents, in terms of... Uh, he is the facilitator and the representative of the culture from the Glazers. Now, the culture from the Glazers is about their investors. They didn't grow up with pictures of the Busby Babes on their wall. They don't come to games. I can remember shortly after they arrived, there was a away game at Wigan, and their attitude towards the Manchester United fans, I've written about this and I've I talked to their people about this, I thought was an arrogance and that, that concerned me. Manchester United, one of the greatest sporting institutions in the world, let alone English footballing institution, and you want them to be in the right hands. So they're, 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 they're cultural problems at Manchester United, which go back to the Glazers, all this focus on money, all this focus on investors, the focus should be on football. Now there are good people behind the scenes at uh, Manchester United. Personally, I mean he's, he's all front of house, I like what Solskjaer is trying to do in terms of the players he's trying to bring in, which is why the last 48 hours and scrabbling around for a 30-year-old who hasn't played in the Premier League for three years is, is embarrassing. But in terms of Wan-Bissaka, Maguire, Daniel James, Daniel James is being overplayed. He's a terrific player, but he, he, is, he is tired. But Solskjaer's, what he's trying to do in terms of recruitment, I do understand in terms of younger, faster, Partly home, homegrown, obviously, Fernandes has, has come in from Portugal. But there is, a, there is a logic there. So you can't say everything's wrong at Manchester United, but there is a cultural problem, and they have to move it away from this obsession with money, focusing back on the football. Mike, you were all over the story linking Manchester United to Josh King at Bournemouth. Mm. How did that unfold, and ultimately, why did it fail? Well, I think how it unfolded was uh, you know, at the very top of... Manchester United, I think they need a clearer, they need clearer direction. I think there needs to be a director of football working with Ed Woodward to have that buffer between him and the and the team because they have they have the cultural reboot in the summer. I thought it was really, I thought it was, a, I think it's a positive way a direction in terms of going to the Championship with Dan James, going to the mid Premier League for Aaron Wambasaka. But then the first obstacle that came along with Erland Haaland, who's on that track as well, they don't get him, and then they're panicking. And it's just a panic that you don't see it at Liverpool and you don't see it at Tottenham really either. I think that they then looked at markets like, like China, which I, didn't, I think there's value in other markets. And, and if they had a, if had a really good director of football there, then that, that would have been different for them. And then as it unfolded, that story itself with them, you know, 48 hours left, they're scrambling around for, for a striker. All of us journalists are trying to find out who's on their list, and it turned out that, that Josh King, who had previously been at United, was, was on, the, on that list, and they'd made a bid for him. Um, so it was a very frantic final, final day for them, which could have been avoided, I think, with, with, a, with a better direction at the top. Um, and even Agarlo's agent himself said he didn't think that the... Um, the deal was on. He didn't and believe it he, either. He, he didn't think it was on until until after the afternoon of um, deadline day. So the afternoon over here, I think it was later in, in China. So that just shows you um, that just shows you kind of the, the level of panic that there was. Um, Craig, Craig he, he, Henry used a strong word there: embarrassing. Mm. He said, "Do you think that's that's fair? Um, a club like Manchester United failing to land these players, and certainly in the case of Erling Haaland, he's now scored seven in three. Mm. Is embarrassing fair? Well, they, they began the window trying to sign Erling Haaland, one of the best young players in Europe, and they've ended it 
trying to get a 30-year-old out of China amid a global health epidemic. I mean, you, you can't really make it up. And I spoke to uh, Mark Lattenberg, one of our columnists at the Mail, and myself and Mark were chatting on, on Friday. Of course, he is, is refereeing yep. out in China. And uh, at the time, the Agalo news was breaking. I, I said to Mark, what's he like? And, you know, Mark won't mind me mentioning this. He said, well, listen, he hasn't played since November. He played in the, the, the Cup final over there, which Mark refereed. He wasn't even starting. He came off the bench. He said, listen, he's sharp, but he's nowhere near a, a Manchester United player, really. And you, it was coming back to the point there, I was gonna, Henry and, and Mike touched on it as well, that we applaud what they did in the summer in terms of this strategy of buying young and British. But I look at the Manchester United team and how many players have they got truly operating at the peak of their powers? You look at the great Man United team, six, seven, eight of that team would have been right where they're at, that golden three to four year period where you're really at the best. What they've got now is either players who aren't good enough and will never be good enough, players who were good enough in the case of Matt and Matic two or three years ago, or boys like Juan Bissaka and James who are, who are a work in progress really. I just look at that team and... I watched the, the, the game on the train down last night and you know that there was one team playing with adventure, freedom, looked dangerous on the break and it, it wasn't Manchester United and Wolves have, and that shouldn't be a surprise because Wolves have simply just got better players. Now that is why I applaud the, the signing of Bruno Fernandes, it looks as if they've brought in a, a player who, who really is you know, 25 year old, I thought he was terrific last night, you, you just get an instinct for these things, he was progressive, he had shots on goal. The biggest compliment I can play Bruno Fernandes is he looked like a Wolves player, <laughs> he looked as if he, he would fit into that team. So to come back to the question, is it embarrassing? Well, well yes it is embarrassing the way the window played out. Well, they, they signed Bruno Fernandes. They spent the most money on a single player in the window. He looks like he's come in. Done well. I mean, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said as well, he's Skulls-like. He's wearing Skulls' his number. Igalo is still in pre-season. They've got, what, 14 games left mm. at Manchester United. So he's not going to be up to speed. It's only till the end of this season. It does look a very strange fit, doesn't it? Fernandes, you can understand, they've tracked for a long time, came in, mm. adjusted perfectly straight away. How far off the pace is Igalo going well, to be? Well, first, on, on Bruno Fernandes, if he's half the player that Scholes was, then, then Manchester United have got an absolute bargain because Scholes was one of the greatest players in, in Manchester United. Also, Scholes had that winning edge which reflected that Ferguson, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the boys, the, 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 the 92 squad. So, yeah, that's quite a step. Igalo, I mean, you look at some of the strikers they've got. Martial actually just looks a little bit like he's lost confidence. Obviously, they've got a sort of issue in midfield, which Bruno Fernandes is, is going to try and address. Actually, that Chris Passer, which, which they've missed with Pogba being out of the frame for sort of various issues. Um, Mason Greenwood, I think there's a talent. I mean, it's very easy just to look at Manchester United in black and white and say, everything's wrong structurally, everything's wrong with the squad. Actually, there's some pretty decent players in that squad. You've got a world-class goalkeeper. I know he's had one or two issues, but De Gea is a good, is, is a good goalkeeper. Brandon Williams is a terrific prospect coming through. Um, Wan Bissaka will probably be in the England squad in the summer. Maguire, okay, maybe not hit the heights of uh, of, of Leicester, but you know there's a definite leader. Well, you uh, could argue Leicester's a better there. team to play in. Better team to play in. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, so it's certainly more um, settled. I mean, look. There are also issues that you can compare Rodgers and, uh, and, and Solskjaer as managers. Solskjaer's one or two of his tactical decisions. Has he got a plan B? One of, you know, does he, his substitutions, are they too late? Does he make the right ones? One or two issues there. But, you know, he's had some decent results against the leading team. So you can't write Solskjaer off. You can't write the squad off. There is an innate resilience to Manchester United, which I hope will see them sort of get back firing again. But they've also got, look, when McTominay comes back, that's an important player. It's frustrating that Pogba's in a world of his own. He's clearly he's clearly moving on. Rashford, when he's fit, you know, he's an England international, he's a world-class talent. Martial is a frustration because if Martial stood up, said, "Right, I'm going to be a real Manchester United line leader. I'm going to take responsibility," that, then that would be great. Daniel James, when he's fine. So let's not write off this squad completely. But clearly, it does need uh, more work. Yeah. Plus a few players to I go out. I think Agallo actually will do quite well. I know that it's <laughs> in, I know in that he, limited time. I do, I do. I think he is in. He is actually in his preseason, as we know. But I just think just a change of angle for that attack, because it was so flat yesterday. It was really, it was a very, very kind of flat afternoon and evening. Actually, there was meant to be a planned walkout to protest, to protest against mm. um, Ed Woodward and, and and the leadership of the club. It never materialised because. I always thought that would be difficult when a game's on a knife edge um, at, uh, midway through a second half. 
but so that never materialised. But it just felt flat the whole the whole attack that they had, the way that they were attacking Wolves. It looked like Wolves were going to going to win that game. I thought that Martial looked so he he, he definitely isn't a, he is not a lone striker and that's why I think Igalo can come in and just offer something different even if it's off the bench and so when will you get up to pace I mean you're looking minimum mm. three weeks well I'm ho you'd, you'd hope that during the during the winter break yeah. he'd have time to work with him and I just I think with at the moment you know Fernandez is a very positive uh, debut from him but he simply can't do it on his own he'll need mm. people running in behind which Martial's not doing at the moment and he'll need I think Pogba fit and he'll definitely need Marsh, um, uh, Rashford fit and that's when we'll see the best of him. The danger with Fernandes is the longer players spend at Manchester United, the worse they seem to get. When was the last time Manchester United truly improved a talent? Someone who went in there then went to the next level, the next level again. A great case in point is Harry Maguire. Harry Maguire isn't the same person we saw last year. You should go into Old Trafford, you should grow an inch, you should be a better player. Harry Maguire, for me, hasn't been the, the player who ultimately we, we thought £75 million was a, was a fair price for. And Mike makes a valid point about Fernandes coming in and he was so good last night, he was so promising, he was, he was so fresh, he was so different. And that's the reason he stood out, because he went into a team who have been anything but that in recent weeks. I think Chris Smalling's improved as a United player simply by not, not being, simply by playing <laughs> for Roma. And, you know, and Romelu Lukaku having left, it seems to have got better. So, you know, mm. it seems, look, that... They're on that. They're on this path that they've chosen, though. So I think it's just they need they need to be stronger to kind of. Do you think it's the right path it. in terms of what think, they're yeah. trying to do culturally to, to come back to that word in terms of the type of player that they're trying to bring? What was very interesting when uh, uh, Social was talking about Bruno Fernandes, he kept on stressing he's a really good character, he's a really good person as well. So obviously he's going down that Southgate route of wanting sort of good citizens to use mm. that horrible FA expression good people as well but they need more leaders and that's what you were there yes they were yeah. Bruno Fernandes did actually look like he yeah. was sort of telling Fred and Pereira it, who really need to be it, held by the hand at times he was one of those well, he, he, he was skipper at sporting wasn't he well, so. he's one of those players I just look at the team that Alex Ferguson had had say his front six had each six were match winners and now you're looking at other people right, let me start with that is that not the biggest problem we are always talking about what Sir Alex Ferguson had, the great Manchester United. It's gone. It's finished. He's not coming back. Over. Each manager that's come in since then, it hasn't worked. And the culture at the club, they're trying to reset, and Gary Neville spoke about it last night. This brought Falcao, Depay, Di Maria. Plenty of them have all failed. I've... So since Sir Alex has gone, they've not only not replaced him in the dugout, they haven't replaced him in terms of signings, both calibre and character. So is that actually still a valid point I of think, reference? I do think it is because it's a standard that Manchester United fans are judging their teams by because they are used they they're used to or they've tasted the success and they expect those players on the pitch. I say the front the front six those fabulous front six, but all the team really had players which would expect the very best from themselves and from their teammates. And I think since Alex Ferguson's era, I've, I've looked at that team and. They expect other people to do it, and they're not like those players who embrace the responsibility. And I think now you have that in this, you know, just throughout this team, people waiting, waiting for other people to be the match winners. Um, and it's and and that is principally why they're in this position. And from a fans dynamic, you're looking at what's going on at uh, Liverpool and this whole Ferguson thing of being knocked off the perch, the 19 against the 20, and the fact that Liverpool are so well run off the field, so well run on it, they've got a charismatic manager who's engaged emotionally with the players, tactically with the players, emotionally engaged with the fans. There's a real lowercase u to Liverpool being united. Everyone is pulling in the, in the same direction, from owners to kit men to fans. To, to I mean, you just look at the quality of their football, and I think that, for if you're looking at it from a Manchester United fans' perspective, they must it must create even more poignancy when they look at their own issues. I think. Okay, we've got to take a break <laughs> right now, but we'll be back shortly. We'll be talking Leicester and Chelsea. Welcome back to Sunday Supplement. Frank Lampard says Chelsea are underdogs to retain their place in the top four going into the last throws of the season. And he made a big decision yesterday against Leicester City. He left out his goalkeeper, Kepper. A decision he said he did not take lightly. Craig, what did you make of that? 
I wasn't surprised. I saw Kepler a couple of weeks ago up in Newcastle when Newcastle somehow stole, stole a, a 94th minute winner and uh, it was the only thing he had to do all afternoon was, was save what was a fairly routine header and it, it flew past him. Uh, and you look at Kepa and he reminds me of David De Gea in the early years at Manchester United, only minus the saves. Now, and that is a, a you know, that's a, a pretty big thing to say about a goalkeeper. He just doesn't get near enough, really. You know, he doesn't make enough saves and he's, he doesn't look like a, a modern day goalkeeper in that. You look at the, your Allisons and your Edisons, you need a goalkeeper now to dominate not just the penalty area, but also the final third. And he, he looks like that little boy coming back to the, the De Gea in the early years at Manchester United. But then, you see Willy Caballero come in yesterday and you understand why they have persevered with Kepa for so long. I mean, Caballero yesterday is arguably caught in the first goal. I know it takes a deflection, but it looks like he's, he's trying to catch a, a crisp packet, really. And the, the second goal, it looks like he's trying to catch a bus where he's going chasing the, the guy outside the box. I know Frank came out and defended him afterwards. But when the alternative is, is Caballero, you see why they've kept Kepa in the team. And I he, suppose also made, he also made some decent saves as well. Yeah. Yeah, he did, but listen, there's a reason Willie Caballero has is, is, is bounced around two or three clubs now as sub-goalkeeper and has never really made that position position his own, and you probably like to think that Frank is trying to send a message to Kepa to, to come back in and really up his game, because what we've seen in, in recent weeks, certainly from Kepa, has probably undermined the progress elsewhere on the pitch for Chelsea. I don't think Sorry, Mike, but you've got to have some sympathy for, for Kepper in terms of the, the rotation and the changes of the centre halves in front of him. It would be must be much better for a, for a goalkeeper if you actually have built up that sort of triangle with the two centre halves or three centre halves. Um, so I've got some sympathy there. But I think what this also shows is the decisiveness of Lampard. I mean, you know, we all talk to him. He's got these images. You know, he's a, he's a very nice, intelligent, personable individual. But I think what shows why Lampard is and will increasingly be a very good manager is he has got this ruthless side to actually, you know, that was a big call, as mm. Craig says, that was a big call yesterday. And probably the white one, if it just sort of focuses Kepper a little bit. I, I, I looked at those goals, I didn't think, I thought he was just slow on them. He was just slow to the Newcastle one and the Bellerin goal against Arsenal. He was just yeah. slightly slow. I didn't think that they were. I didn't think it was terminal. I didn't think like, right, this is this guy's a bad keeper. You know, I, I thought that this is to do with sharpness, which can be improved on. Do I think that he is the world's best keeper because he's the world's most expensive keeper? Mm. No, I don't think so. You look at Old Trafford yesterday. Peter Schmeichel came into the room in the press room, and you just felt presence mm. there. And he's got a presence even in a room long since hand, uh, hung his gloves up and I think that comes with time not physical but just a presence around the but I think De Gea didn't have that like you say he didn't have that at the start and I think that comes with time I, I don't think it's terminal for him but I think it's a really it's it's good man management in some ways that I think he'll be stronger for mm. it I mean you mentioned the rotation of the centre halves <coughs> in front of them Chelsea have conceded 43 goals that's the most in the top eight could that be their undoing in their quest for a top four place yeah. Sorry, 34, 34. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, did, did Lampard actually use the word underdog? Or did he just yes. say that, right, OK. I mean, if he, if he said, well, listen, we're in fourth, so you know, we're, we know we're in a battle. I, think he, was, but, I but, think he was referring not to where they are on the table now, at the start of the season, sure. and when the transfer ban was in place, yeah. we were underdogs. Yeah. People saw us, nobody put us in the top four. Yeah, the transfer ban was in place and then they got it lifted and they didn't really go for anyone or didn't succeed in going for anyone in the, in the window. I, look, I think Lampard has been a, a, a force for good. I think maybe some of the... Mason Mount, just what I was only watching the game on television, but Mason Mount has not quite got that creative best that he had earlier in the season. Tammy Abraham looks like he's, he's, the, the winter break's coming at the, the right time for him. But, you know, they've been terrific and Lampard has been a force for good. But this idea of sort of underdogs... I mean, Chelsea are an established team a wealthy team and you look at the team above them and Leicester City and what they've done was it is it's still an eight point gap between yeah. them I mean they mm. have you know if any if anyone has has overachieved in inverted commas it's j just to see Leicester City in there it's brilliant it's down to good management by Brendan Rodgers good players good leaders on the pitch uh, strong individuals, plus also a good academy. You look at some of the players, they've got three, I think they had at least three academy players on the pitch yesterday. And also it's a very well-run club and the recruitment is fantastic. We were talking about Manchester United earlier. I mean, so many clubs could learn from how Leicester are run as a club, run as a team, but also their recruitment. I mean, the players they get, I mean, Tielemans. I mean, Tielemans could start for Manchester United. Tielemans could walk into, certainly, most midfield barring the top two 
and Leicester City got him. I think you, when you saw Telemann celebrate the goals yesterday, you could just see that bond they've got. Um, and that underdog philosophy, which Brendan, uh, I'm sure, has been inculcating in them, and Leicester City obviously had during the title winning season in 2016, that is still there and alive. And that sort of, we're the underdogs, and they're heading to the Champions League. And it's one of the, along with Sheffield United, I was going to say, Liverpool, it's one of the stories of the Sheffield season. Sheffield United. Yeah, I, I was going to say, people, you know, I think everybody quite likes being the underdog in this, in this race, mm. and Sheffield United. Um, you know, Frank says that they're the underdog. I can see why when you see Sheffield United playing the, the way that they have for the first half of the season and having a really, really good January. Mm. I think they bought really well. I think there's just a couple of games where Chris Wilder might have thought, right, we're flagging here a little bit. They put so much into that first few months. Maybe when they lost the lead against Manchester United, and you think, right, th these play you know, these players might need a bit of help. And I think he's bought so well. Um, with Sander Berg coming in and I think that you know, if Chelsea are underdogs I think coming up on the rails is, is Sheffield United and, and who, you know, they're in fifth at the moment. Who's, Who's your manager of the year? If you're going to vote for it now, I know it's obviously something that the, you know, the, the LMA do, but is it Klopp or is it Wilder? I, I almost think you should break with precedent to a degree and have two. You know, if you can yeah. in, somehow magic up a second award for Chris mm. Wilder he deserves recognition. Myself and Mike have spent a lot of time at Bramall Lane this year, and invariably we, we sit next to each other, so we've seen a lot of Sheffield United. And it's, it's a real victory for management, what he's achieved there. Look at the team sheet before kick-off, and it's misfits. It really is. You know, mm -hmm. 12 months ago, this was a, a bunch of guys who'd never played in the Premier League. But Chris Wilder has identified a way to play, and he had to do this to get out of League One. This, was, this is two or three years in the making now, and they've never wavered from that belief, that strategy. There was something so identifiable about them. And it, it, it's, it's taken the Premier League by surprise, really. No team yet has really worked out a way to, to combat it. And what are we, 25 games in? And Chris Wilder, he's believable. Listen, we all sit down in front of managers, and just as human beings, you, yeah. you get a feel for, for guys who are, who are spinning you a yarn. Chris Wilder isn't. He truly is somebody who, if you were in his dressing room, you would want to play from. I think, uh, is he deserving of a, of a job at a better club? Well, well, that's a question for another day, but what he's doing at Sheffield United at the moment, his own team, his own players who have bought into him, suits him, and there's no reason why they can't challenge for that, that fourth spot, really, because Chelsea, what, Chelsea have won one in five now, I think. Uh, the likes of Sheffield United, Wolves even, with a little bit of ambition, a little bit of focus, can go on to take fourth. Well, another thing that may well hamper Chelsea is, I mean, we talked about Manchester United, their search for a striker in January. Of course, they had their own problems as well. Desperate to bring somebody in, up front didn't happen and Olivier Giroud whose spirits must be lower mm. than a snake's belly right now. Yeah well they wanted Dries Mertens in mm. didn't they as well. Um, the workload on Tammy Abraham has, has, has clearly been so much and he you know he, he, he needs a break. Um, Giroud I mean just the look on Batshuayi's face when he, when, well, he, he when, when, when Ross Barkley came on I think mm. Willian played up front as a sort of Fools, whatever, um, and it almost looked like Chelsea were happy to close out for a point. Was actually in the grand scheme of things, it, it wasn't what they needed. Yeah, absolutely. They need. But look, this is a broader thing. I think Jason Burke wrote a good piece in your paper a couple of weeks ago about there are no centre forwards around anymore. No, I mean, there are yeah, obviously yeah. some outstanding yeah. ones, Lewandowski, individuals like that. But actually, there is a dearth of them. Whether that's sort of tactical changes, whether it's because coming through the academy, every kid wants to be a ten rather than a nine. You know, that, that's a broader issue. So should should we? Should we temper criticism of clubs who didn't find a forward this window? Because they just aren't I, there. I think so, because yeah. um, you have United getting hammered for signing a Carlo, yet there actually isn't, you know, the number nines are not, are not there. I think the market um, for the people that I was talking to was really small for what these club, clubs wanted, um, Premier League or kind of Champions League experience, but on a loan. And that market really shrunk to Piatek, who ended up going on a permanent to, um, to Germany um, and then you've got Slimani who ended up staying where he was so you, you're really in, and Cavani staying where he was I think it was that market was so small so in some ways we're having a go at, 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 for, at United for panic buying um, and then Chelsea I think you know keeping their powder dry but they also have Olivier Giroud on the bench a World Cup winner and Michi Batshuayi a World Cup semi-finalist I think you know, they, they stayed calm, even though mm. Frank kind of 
seems to think that mm. it, there seems to be a bit of frustration there. Mm. We, we saw Frank a bit, uh, Newcastle two weeks ago and spoke to him afterwards and this was slap bang in the middle of the window and as you do you go outside for your huddle and Frank made it clear that he wanted a, he wanted a striker. Mm. We just seen Chelsea dominate a game for 90 minutes yet Tammy Abraham looked clumsy, looked tired and listen Tammy's a, a fantastic player and will be a fantastic player but when this, when the news of this ban being lifted broke uh, last year, uh, halfway through the, the season, you almost greeted it with, oh no, you thought they're mm. going to throw money at it and this young, wonderful team are going to be, Lose the unit. Going, going to be broken up. Well, we've since arrived at the end of January and you're thinking, you know what, they actually did need some help and there's a danger that this wonderful start of the season could be undone by not bringing in a little bit of experience and a little bit of freshness. Does it underline, perhaps, what we were saying, the dearth of strikers available at the moment? A manager like Frank Lampard, who clearly is uh, very popular with the mm. Chelsea owners, delighted the job he's done so far mm. under difficult circumstances, so they would have backed him financially in the window, yet they couldn't. Mm. Yes, well, they well, literally couldn't buy a striker. Well, I've been having the same conversation with Steve Bruce for a month now up at Newcastle as to why... You've had you, many conversations with <laughs> Steve Bruce. As to, to, to why aren't you bringing in a striker, and it's the same answer every time. There's none out there, and Steve Bruce says there is nobody out there better than what I have now, what he has is a very low bar, and that gives you an idea as to, to the dearth of options there really, really are. That's why he took Andy Carroll in the first place. I think that's why Christian Benteke became an option for people. It was just, it was just a number nine with some Premier League experience mm. that people wanted, and whether it's worth taking the gamble on that for a, few, for a few months, whether it's worth it. I think United have, and Chelsea obviously think that it's... That it's better not well, to. Cheng, Cheng Tosson. Cheng Tosson was one of the few players available in three weeks ago. Steve Bruce sent me a direct question. He said, Would you take Cheng Tosson? And I said, Well, yes, because he's somebody, and at the moment you've, you've got nobody. Cheng Tosson goes to Crystal Palace and he's injured. Well, he also scored when he scored well, he at the score. Etihad. Everybody yeah, yeah, was yeah. saying, Do yeah. Freeman. I, I, I wanted to get into to Newcastle in some depth in the next part. I, I'm just interested in what you think realistically is going to be enough points for fourth place. Um, because it's a, a very, very low bar. I mean, Liverpool in 2003-04 finished with 60 points. That's their lowest total for fourth there's mm. been. Chelsea are on target for that at the moment, those mm. sort of numbers. What, why has there been this, this fall away elsewhere? Liverpool being so... Liverpool are just there and it looks like the rest, everybody else is, uh, is scrambling mm. for those other three positions in the top four. I just think that they're so good. Um, yeah. And... and it, it goes right down. Um, it goes right down to Everton, who might get there, mm. and you might even say Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's also a consequence. It wouldn't say that. It would kill him. <laughs> it, it's, it's also a consequence of the teams at the bottom. There's no dead men this year as well. They're all picking up points. So what you've got is a, a truncated uh, middle of the table almost, if you like. I mean, you know, West Ham's on, on 24 points in their third bottom. They're, they're picking up a point a game. So you're looking at the, the barrier for. Uh, sorry, the. Uh, the watermark for survival being sort of 39, 40 points. It hasn't been that for, for a lot of years mm. this year. Even Newcastle, we keep on referencing, they're in 10th and they're by no means out of it. You know, the, you, you could argue Newcastle should be looking up, but rather they're looking over the shoulder the other way because every team down there at the moment is capable of, of getting points. Even Norwich, we saw last night, you know, they're bottom, but they're a decent team. The last two, three weeks of the season could be interesting because you might have teams fighting against relegation and also flirting with Europe. Because mm. he does Constantino into the middle, that was which is a slight reflection on it's not a great league, barring this this phenomenal Liverpool team and one or two outliers, you know, Wolves, Sheffield United, who deserve a lot of credit. Yeah. So I think Southampton could have gone uh, yeah. eighth or seventh. Yes, I mean, not so long ago, you know, battling relegation, well, and it, it shows you how quickly that that can change for these teams. It can turn. Watford looked like they'd turn the corner all and of a sudden. Didn't. And there. the other one was Burnley, which um, which I love going to cover, and and Sean Dyche looked like he was battling relegation and then a couple of wins over Christmas and the reporter were asking him, yeah, you're not far off seventh here. Mm. Um, yeah, Eddie yeah. Howe, Bournemouth. Yeah. I mean, two good results and uh, you know, they're, they're, they're on the move again. But, but Henry, there, you say it's not a great league. Is that based on the, the likes of Arsenal, Chelsea, Manchester United falling away? Because for me, at the, yeah. you see the teams at the bottom, I think the likes of Brighton, Villa, whenever I see them, they generally play well. They, 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 they play good football, but I don't think it's the strongest league we've had, barring the phenomenal Liverpool team. OK, we have to take another break right now, but afterwards we're going to be talking Newcastle United. Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement. We are joined this week by Henry Winter of The Times, Mike McGrath of The Telegraph and Craig Hope of The Daily Mail. Now, Craig, 
I want to talk to you about your relationship with Newcastle and, in particular, Steve Bruce. Mm. Um, last time you were on the show, which was back on October the 6th, you said, and I'll quote, it's hard to tell what the identity is, what the style is, what they're all about, what Steve Bruce is trying to do. Uh, to which Steve Bruce responded, I've managed 400 games in the Premier League, do you not think I know what I'm doing? You said, I'm not interested in that. Later the same day, they beat Manchester United 1-0. Mm. They're now in the top half, 10th, <laughs> seven points above the relegation zone. Do you stand by what you said? I do, yeah. The more... Do you still say the same? Yes. In terms of there is no identifiable style to, to that team, the more I watch that team this season, the less I understand football. I really do. There is, there is no clear identity of what they want to achieve, yet somehow they find themselves in 10th and relatively comfortable. Now, this, is, this, this might sound ridiculous. This has been a relegation season in all but points tally. It really has. In every measurable degree, Possession, uh, shots conceded, shots on target, goals, goals conceded, everything you want, they are in the bottom three. Yet somehow they have found a way to win matches, and that is to Steve's credit, they've found a way to win matches through a combination of good fortune, a brilliant goalkeeper who emerges as man in the match every week, and things you probably can't, can't quantify, like spirit and, and teamwork and work ethic and all the rest of it. But there is no, still, you watch them last night, and there is no, you're watching the team and you're thinking, what are they really trying to achieve? What is Steve Bruce and them out to do? They should have been beaten by Norwich last night. It was incredible that they, they emerged with a, a goalless draw, really. But that's how they've played all season, only minus the, 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 late, the late goals to bail them out, really. Defenders have scored 12 from 24 this season. There's very little imagination in the, in the final third. They've got four strikers who have got one goal between them. They've got an £80 million strike force, if you include the wingers, who have only scored four times between them this season. And I think over time, if you map it out, the way they are playing, they should really be in the, in the bottom three. I go back to, I mentioned this off air, you expect the goals. Now, uh, I'm a big believer in expect the goals when it supports my argument, and it does this time. <laughs> now, uh, expect the goals would have Newcastle bottom of the Premier League on nine points, in terms of, you know, were, were they on the, on the balance of chances, uh, should they have, have won games. But forget all of that, just believe your eyes. And I watch this team, and it's, it's, listen, it's, it's a team, it's, it's a band of brothers, if you like, who keep on going to the end, evidenced by the, the two late goals they got at Everton. But it's not a good team, and I worry that over time they will revert to probably what they deserve, and that is a team who should really be in the relegation mix. OK, playing devil's advocate, mm. expected goals, you could say, if my aunt, there is also mm. that. <laughs> and also, as well, you say, other than points. Mm. That is the whole point. They're, half, they're halfway up the table. Yeah. Are, are, you, are, are you not stuck in a rut of criticising them and, no. and, and afraid to move away from that? Also as well, you mentioned this band of brothers, this spirit. Mm. You could look at some teams in the Premier League table, some in the top half, managers would give their right arm for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely give their right arm for it. Yeah, and, and to Steve's credit, what I will say is the players have never really down tools from one or two games this season. They have, but there's always been a response. And that is massively to his credit, and I've, I've committed that to print as well. But I just think the bigger picture in where they are going, where they are going under Steve, I don't yet see what he wants to do with this team, and I'm just concerned that the longer... Do you mean style of play? Yeah, I, the, well, there isn't a style of play. The style of play is go out, play relatively poorly, give the ball to the opposition, don't create any chances and hope that you nick something later on. Yeah, but that, obviously that, that, that's not deliberate. And also, is there not a case as well? He can only work with what he's got. There is that, but I still suspect this team is perhaps better than, than what they're, they're playing at the moment. Steve comes back to the, I don't know if you want to call it an excuse, but you know they're limited. He says that they can't do what he wants them to do and that he's got to revert back to Rafa's tactics, which in the first half of last season certainly was sit deep, you know, keep it tight, don't give away many chances and, and see what you can get on the break. But that ignores the fact that towards the back end of last season, under Benitez, they, they actually developed into a pretty free-flowing attacking team who, who was good to watch, and this year they've been anything but that. For the large part, it's been awful, it really is. I agree with your point about Benitez. I mean, that, that, that was crazy that he left, but they are above Arsenal, and how many of Newcastle's players will get into uh, Arsenal's eleven? Not actually that many, and that is to great credit to uh, Steve Ruth. You talk about, as, uh, as Jeff says, that you know the team spirit and the work ethic. That The manager sets the tone for that. You make the point about quite a few of the goals, you say it's 11 or 12 goals have actually come from defenders. 12 of 24 have been defenders. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Well, let's break that down. How many of those have come from set pieces? Mm. And then the corollary to that is actually should Steve Bruce get some coaching. credit for that? Yeah. The, co the coaching. Mm. But they've also had a player in Alan St. Maximin who was certainly in the first half of the season masked a lot of the shortcomings. He was a real 
Jack in the box and he was someone who took the ball in areas of the pitch which on the balance of play and possession Newcastle had no right to be and then he would invariably win the, the throw in the free kick of the corner from, from which the score but, but sorry isn't that tactics by the manager you've got this magical individual and we all love watching him play oh. and if, if Bruce's tactics are give the ball to Sam Maximum and let him do his magic in the box. But there was no, that, that was plan A, there was, there was no plan B. And when Sam Maximum was out the team, Newcastle have only won once without him in the side this season. It just, it, it, without Sam, Sam Maximum in the side, for me, it exposed the shortcomings of a, of a, a clear he lack of identity. He was in the side. He was in the side. No, when he came out of the side. Uh, the but sorry, that's a reflection on squad strength. And is the manager completely responsible for recruitment at the club? You'd know better the, 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 than I would. Some of the players there, for me, they don't look good enough at that club. You can't blame Steve Bruce for, for the whole he crazy did, he, came, he came in and said he was absolutely delighted with the window. So, you know, he applauded the signing of Joe Linton, a £40 million centre forward. Don't forget, he has got another club record by so, now. So, you, you would know, was Joe Linton a Steve Bruce signing? No, he wasn't, absolutely not. Joe well, Linton then, so, how can you blame Steve Bruce for that? If he's dealing with the sort of, effectively, the strange recruitment of other individuals. I'm not I'm blaming Steve Bruce for that, but what I'm saying is he was given a £40 million striker who, right. when he came into the club, said he'd watched him and that he ultimately signed off on the deal. Now, they'd been tracking Joe Linton for the best part of nine months or whatever it was. Steve Bruce wasn't at the club then, but sure. he did say that it was his decision to give it the green light. Steve had, I think Steve Bruce had a massive say in a massive role in Danny Rose coming to the club. Um, and he had, uh, Danny Rose had a lot of offers. And I think that's, you know, that's. Credit to Steve Bruce and it's a real also, coup that signing. That, that was it? a big, real big, coup. big signing for them. You know, in England, I mean, I'm not saying you are, yeah, but I think yeah, it's all um, Craigie slightly. I mean, I've, I've, do you think you Craig's know, been overly harsh on Steve Bruce? Uh, I do actually, but then I'm looking at it from the outside, and I'm looking at it from someone who's who's covered Steve Bruce's career, um, certainly the latter part of it as a, as a player, but also you know having interviewed him all the way down the line. And there is a, a passionate football man who, because of his engaging character, people underestimate the fact that there is a tactical uh, mind in there. You look at the managers that he's he's worked under, uh, particularly Ferguson, Sir Alex Ferguson. I, I think. Look, you're right in the middle of it. You have a relationship with the club. You see Newcastle every week. But looking at it from the outside, whenever I've seen Newcastle United, often I think they're punching above their weight in terms of the squad that Steve Bruce has been given. I think tactically, mm. yes, you, you're right. He does. He seems to get the best out of players. I think it's his man management is his, is his mm. greatest asset. He can relate to players. He's got a great way of dealing with people in general, staff at clubs that he's been at, like, like Hull, where there have been problems. And I think in some ways underestimated like that because I mean he's dealing with what what he can at you know at, at Newcastle United it's not as if he's got it's the slight message. issue that he's not Rafa Benitez and he's seen as Ashley's man and he won't go out and criticize Ashley now we all criticize Ashley and I completely empathize with the with the Newcastle fans Ashley's not a great owner of uh, Newcastle United but Steve Bruce is not going to stand well, up I'm in the press conference and criticize that. Ashley just one interesting stat to throw in after 25 games right now Newcastle United have 31 points under Steve Bruce, mm. under Rafa Benitez, say. he's yeah. 24 points. So that, that works. Yeah, that works on the assumption that Newcastle. No, it just are, works are, on after 25 no, games. No, no. <laughs> the, the, okay. That, the, this comparison they've drawn all season. Newcastle had a, had a very difficult first half of the season last year. What that comparison ignores and, and, and fails to recognise is that during the second half of the season, they were in the top six. One, the longer if a team, and this this has always been the case for Rafa, I think, over his career. The longer a team is exposed to Rafa, the better they get. Certainly last season, towards the back end of last, last year, Newcastle were magnificent under Rafa, and they were going in a direction they hadn't been previously. There was all the criticism about how he set up teams uh, against the top sides, but they'd really moved away from that. This season, and forget all the numbers, forget everything else, believe your you eyes. Can't say that. No, 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 believe you. Can't you, say forget the, the numbers. Be, no, no, believe you, the numbers which I'm using to criticise Steve Booth with. I mean, f forget right, those okay. numbers. Believe, believe your eyes, and that is a team who for me, have regressed on what we saw at the back end of last season. OK, they've, listen, they've lost a couple of big players in terms of Perez and Rondon, but they've also brought in Sam Maximum and Joe Linton players. Steve Bruce said he was, he was more than happy to, to have, who cost £60 million. Yeah, but he's not so. going to criticise them when the club's brought them in. Come on, be, be, be realistic. No, let's, no, but, let's but, but they, they also are £60 million worth of talent sure. who, he, who he's got to work with. You know, yeah, he's, Craig, he's, Craig. He's not, this isn't a Galo who's being put on him here. It's if your newspaper brought in a new editor you didn't fancy, would you tweet, so-and-so's coming, pfft, don't fancy him whatsoever. It's unrealistic to expect a manager to criticise a player that's no, coming. I'm not saying he should have to, to, to criticise them. What I'm saying is that, you know, on and off the record, he declared himself happy with the players who came in. It's then his job to work with them. Now, Joe Linton hasn't improved in, in, in the Steve Bruce. Now, personally, I just think they've got this one wrong. You know, there's the argument, does he need time? Does he need better coaching? 
I just think they've signed a bad player, to be honest with you. And to, to that degree, I've got a certain amount of sympathy with Steve. OK, I'd, li I'd like to move on. And you are absolutely uh, the man in the know with regards to Newcastle, mm. right across the board. This latest proposed takeover, mm. um, <laughs> was that a, a cynical nod? Is, is this even just like, a bit. <laughs> in your, in your, you look world-weary with regards to Newcastle <laughs> takeover stories. Is this just not happening again for you? I've got a lot of experience of false uh, slash fabricated slash, slash failed takeovers. Uh, listen, on the evidence of what I've seen and what I've heard during the course of the past 10 days, whatever it is, I've seen nothing to convince me this is either A, genuine or B, going to happen. And that is certainly a sentiment which is being echoed within the, the football club at senior level, I think. You know, we sat down with Steve on Friday and we had a conversation on and off the record about the takeover. Steve, on the record, said, you know, I've heard nothing, I've been told nothing. Now, you'd like to this think... Is, this, sorry, Craig, this, let's clarify. This is the PCP takeover for Amanda Staveley mm -hmm. because there are a couple of other bids allegedly no, out there. It's not PCP, it's Amanda Staveley yeah. plus the Saudi royal family yeah. plus the, the Rubin brothers from London. So that, that's the current takeover. It's been reported as it was going to happen on Wednesday, it was going to happen on Friday. Those deadlines have, have come and gone and the problem we've, we've got is, and the problem certainly the club have got, and I think Steve is very sceptical in this regard, is that it's the same characters, the same faces who appeared two years ago saying the same things. Now ultimately that led to Mike Ashley calling Amanda Staveley a time waster in public. I've seen nothing to make me believe anything different this time around. I think the, I remember when Abramovich took over Chelsea and it just came yeah. out. It was just like, I think, um, I, th I think a film crew was following Danny Fulbrook, the late, Danny, late great Danny Fulbrook around at the time. And it was literally like, we've got to get to Stamford Bridge. Who is, who is Roman Abramovich? He's taking over mm. Chelsea. These takeovers don't normally come up come with a mm. big run up and that's that's the, that's where I think the scepticism comes in yep. whether it will actually happen um, because obviously there have been false dawns you know in the future. Do you think Mike Ashley actually genuinely wants to sell because I mean when well, I go I, to St James's Park the whole place looks like a huge advertisement for his sports shops mm. and he's got that I don't know whether he's developing um, sports directors around the world but if you are going to just show your name around the world. What better place to do it than a Premier League this game? With I mean, I, I remember you guys. We were talking to you guys once, and you said it, you, you counted up the number of advertisements mm. or mentions of Sports Direct it's in the building. Football. But it was about it was about sort of like 120, 130. So does he then necessarily want to sell something which is a fantastic advertising vehicle for yeah. his main business? It's a good point you're making. It's a question a lot of supporters ask. There's two elements to this. One, to sell a football club, you've got to have a buyer. Mm. And to my mind, Mike Ashley has never had a viable, legitimate buyer for that football club in the six years I've covered them for the Daily Mail. Two, that the question, should a buyer present itself, what do you want to sell? But we don't know. I can't see why he would want to sell. Mm. As long as that football club is ticking over in the Premier League, it's a wonderful vehicle yeah. for his sports brand, as okay. you can rightly say. OK, we've only got a few moments before we have to take another break. Henry, there are understandable questions <clears throat> with regards to the morality of a bid involving Saudi Arabia. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the Newcastle paper, the Chronicle, did a poll of something like 5,700 Newcastle fans and 80% of them said, uh, yes, we, we, we would be happy to have it. If you go on the, uh, I went on the government's website this morning, advice on investing in Saudi Arabia, it's not something I intend doing, but actually they said, yeah, go for it, there are one or two issues, and we... Our exports to South Africa, to South Africa, Saudi Arabia are four billion a year in services, i.e., in individuals going over there and using their technical skills. It's another two billion a year. So we do six, we export six billion. We get four billion back in terms of, uh, sorry, we spend four billion pounds on their oil and other services that the, the Saudis. So the government says go for it. So I can understand why football. You know, we live in a hypocr hypocritical age. I can understand why football fans say, well, the government says we can sell arms to Saudi Arabia. Why can't we get them? Money and buy uh, you know, mm. some, some decent strikers. I do have certain <laughs> issues, you know, as, as well human beings, as journalists. You know, you saw what happened to Khashoggi. You saw what's happened in uh, in in the Yemen. They're huge issues with sports washing. We know what their intentions are, but until the government say no, we shouldn't be doing deals with Saudi Arabia, you can understand why clubs are doing it and why fans are saying if we're getting an upgrade on Joe Linton. Then, then do it. OK, very last word, and I'm going to try and achieve the impossible, get a positive word out of Craig Hope on Newcastle United. Yes or no, Danny Rose, is he a good signing? Yes. Wow. That's an exclusive. <laughs> right. <laughs> Join us after the break. We'll be talking Tottenham Man City. Welcome back to Sunday Supplement. Let's have a quick look now at what's coming up 
on goals on Sunday. I think we're here now. Who they've got on this week? Hello, good morning. <laughs> Pat show today. Um, we we've got a special have guest, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Nigel Pearson is our guest today. He's honouring a commitment that he made to me before he became the Watford manager, and he hasn't let me down. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to talk to him, of course, after they lost yesterday. Yeah, very much indeed. I pity you. <laughs> <laughs> I pity you. We'll see you at eleven thirty with Nigel Pearson. <laughs> Vicky or Cammy definitely wouldn't have made that call after they got done yesterday, would they? So fair play to Nigel Pearson. Made the commitment and he's still coming on. Right, let's talk uh, Tottenham Manchester City later on today. Mike, what do you make of the work that Jose Mourinho has done at Tottenham? Looked like a pretty good uh, transfer window for them. And now, of course, he's at comparable stage. 12 games in charge. Same as Poch for this season. I think it's slightly. I think it's it's difficult to compare because just you have that natural bounce that happened with with Jose Mourinho. I think now the the hard work really will really find out what type of reign he's going to have at, at Spurs and whether it's going to last, how long it's going to last. You know, whether it's going to be the end of next season or maybe maybe further. I think he's been dealt an absolute hammer blow with Harry Kane. Um, being injured and now this is going to be a real test of how good he is as a coach and I think still in that in that one game environment he can still pull off these incredible performances tactically which is why I wouldn't I wouldn't say today is going to be a Manchester City you know that, that Manchester City is going to win easily I think he's still got it in him to pull off these incredible master, master strokes tactically but now is so? really. Le I, th I think he's less and less on that. I mean, we remember sort of, the, you know, the Inter Milan game at, uh, at at Barcelona when he would come up with. He played the underdog card. He would actually get his team absolutely tactically inspired to play against one of the top teams. Do you think he's necessarily doing it so much against the, the, the leading teams as he used to? I think he still showed. He still showed it in those. Uh, in even in the dark days at United, he still had. He still had that. Son, one. Son takes the chance against Liverpool. Exactly. And, different different yeah. story. And then you, you know you have him against Pep Guardiola, who you know the the, the rivalry that that they had in in Spain never really materialised in Manchester. But it's still this will be the type of game I think where he will be. Saying to himself and his players that this is this is me showing that we are that I'm still a force to be reckoned. No, with. he's a force to be reckoned with, and he's he's a fantastic manager. No one disputing that. But don't think the Klopp and Guardiola have have taken the game mm. on tactically. Well, well, it's interesting. That there's the Danny Murphy column in now appear the Daily Mail on Sunday, and Murphy makes the point that he would rather play for Jose as opposed to Pep. And he says, I'm quoting him here: Jose Mourinho has not been left behind by the modern game. Well, I think he has. And Danny says, you know, he still. Can come up with a game plan. Yes, he can come up with a game plan to spoil the modern game. That's all he can do. You know, in terms of him rolling out a, a team, a strategy, a style of play with adventure, freedom, pressing, energy, all of that. That's not a, a Jose Mourinho team anymore. That's what Klopp and Guardiola do. And as Henry quite rightly said, they have taken that to the next level. On his day, now Jose can probably do something to disrupt that, but he can't compete with those guys at that level over the course of a season. And you made the point about uh, the Liverpool game a couple of weeks ago. Jose got a lot of stick for that. I actually thought it was a the mm. game plan which worked on the day and the one chance away from, from getting what would have been a result which would have been applauded. He still, he still won, look, he won the Europa I still think that's mm. a fantastic season when he won the Europa League and came second with, with, kind of with what he had with him and what he got out of those players. That still shows that he is, I mean, he's still very relevant and he still gets, and it's just the way that he plays which is what, I mean, you spoke to Harry Winks and it doesn't seem that yeah, you know, that would Harry Winks be his type of player? He's not like that, and he's mm. not. He doesn't win games the same way that Klopp and and Guardiola do. But I still think that he's got it in him to to get to improve this Spurs team. It's interesting when you look at some of his signings in in this window. Obviously, he wanted a striker, but you look at Bergwijn. I mean, that, that there was a sort of creative attacking mm. player, obviously from 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 out wide, making Lo Celso's. Uh, loan deal permanent, I think, is an inspired move because he's bringing a little bit more. I mean, look, I agree with you. Mourinho will have will have seen the issues in the in the in the Spurs squad. They need a little bit more pace, a little bit more vitality, and he's brought that in. But yeah, I mean, Winks was saying that actually, his his, his man manager is fantastic. You know, if you're not in the squad, if you're not in the team, he will come and sort of talk to you. And communication is is key. But I just think, in terms of Jose Mourinho, for ten years was in the top two managers in the world. I, wouldn't, I don't think he's in the top five, maybe not top ten. Though. I do wonder mm. whether Winks might suffer from from the change of management because, I mean, for me, I, I, I'm a big Harry Winks fan. I think he could be like Michael Carrick 
the way that he passes the ball, um, and I thought where he played, I thought he played extremely well against Liverpool in the Champions, Champions League, League final. final. It was a wrong decision to take him off, mm -hmm. but Mourinho generally goes for power in in the midfield rather than his type of player. Do you think Harry Winks gets the credit that he no, deserves as a player no. because he seems to me to be. Whenever I talk to other players, they talk about Harry Winks. Mm. They talk. They, they, he, they say he's, he is so good. He's not a kid. He's, he's 24 today. Mm. In fact, happy, happy birthday, birthday, Harry. <laughs> um, he's 24 years of age, but he seems to do the simple things with the minimal fuss, which is a great skill in itself. Yeah. And yet, he's not really. I mean, I know Jordan Henderson suffered from a similar type of thing, although there was more actual criticism of Jordan Henderson. Now that tide has changed, has turned rather. Do you think we'll see the same with Harry Winks? I think Harry Winks is a lovely player who, who keeps the ball and never loses it, and that's a, a, great, uh, a great ability to have. But remember Pochettino's quote that Harry Winks can be England's Iniesta. Mm. Now, I think in the deep line position, he, he, he demonstrates a lot of those qualities. He keeps the ball, he can turn in tight areas, never gives it away. But what he doesn't do, what Iniesta did, he doesn't impact in the final mm. third. Now, for Harry Winks to take his game to the next level from that central midfield position, he's got to do more. You mentioned Michael Carrick there. Michael Carrick's great quality was forward passes. He assisted the assist a lot of times. He would pick little little avenues, mm. play balls in little corridors. Winks, for me, doesn't do that enough. There's a lot of pass, 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 and where there's a lot of it go to, I'm not entirely convinced I was, by I was, that. Yeah, I was talking to, to, to Winks about that. I don't really know him. I talked to him after the Champions League final where he came into the mix zone, heartbroken, but spoke like a leader. He was very he was impressive mm. off the field as he, as he was on it. And when I saw, saw him last week, I mean, you know, fantastic. He went into a room full of um, elderly, uh, elderly residents of his care home, dementia, and he was absolutely brilliant with them. You know, because footballers, you know, we've all been to these events with footballers, and it can be a little bit sort of awkward being out of their comfort zone. So, fair play to him. What a character. Credit to his parents, his upbringing, to, to the club, the academy. Um, and also Pochettino, who he had, you know, who gave him his debut, and uh, there was obviously, it's probably still is, a sort of strong connection there. But I said to him, I said, listen, you were a huge admirer of Steven Gerrard growing up, because he's a massive, passionate England fan as well as Spurs fan. Um, but you so admired Steven Gerrard because of his performances with England and with respect to his uh, Liverpool career. Why don't you dominate games? like Gerard does, if you do admire this, wh when are you going to take the, the next step? And I agree that he does in that sort of subtle way, so some of his passes, but actually really dominating. And maybe it's a sort of tactical thing with he plays as a six or an eight or wh whatever, he's, he's different position. Um, but I think he's got it within him, as, he's, as you say, he's 24 today. He li he's played some fantastic games against the big teams, Borussia Dortmund, Real mm. Madrid down the years, obviously in the Champions League final, which Spurs, Spurs lost. So there is definitely a player in there. But you know he needs to take a step up. But he's certainly got the technical skill okay. and the desire to do it. I just want to ask you, the three of you as well, about Manchester City. Where are they in a strange place mentally now? Long way behind Liverpool, and also they are a long way ahead of fifth place. I, I think that. They, so is it is this a different type of challenge to get really good performances week in week out? I think so. I think. Is, is it a strange place yeah, to occupy? Pe pe I think Pep has mentioned this before, it's not usual for these players not to be competing for a title, yet they do still have the Champions League against Real Madrid, which will be very important to them, and, and of course the Carabao Cup final. I just think there's a, I think Simon Mullock wrote a story today about, the, about this summer being a real crossroads, but I think, I think there will have to be a rebuild. It's kind of crept up on City a little bit. Some of the players are getting uh, are now kind of late 20s and they're going to have to have a look at bringing some new players in. It doesn't seem like the academy, there's going to be a massive influx from, from the academy. So I think this could be a real, a real crossroads for, for City and, and where they go. Sunes' column is always good in the Sunday Times and he makes the point about how different it would have been in, in January 2018 if mm. uh, City had pushed more to try and get Virgil van Dijk and the influence that, mm. uh, that he would have had. Look, he's been unfortunate in, in losing well, his best centre-half, Laporte. They should have prepared better for the succession to Vincent company, not simply his ability on the pitch, and an you know, amazing sort of goal which almost sort of settled the, the, the title, but also his strength of character as a leader is one of the most remarkable individuals in football, Vincent Company. so to lose him was huge. But this idea that there's some sort of existential crisis going on at Manchester City, when you go there, you see the ground, you look at the training ground, you not, look at the not, squad that they've got, I don't think there'll be uh, too not, many not, people, certainly down the leagues, not, even in the Premier League, not, uh, not, grieving not, and worrying for them. Plus also, when you look at Guardiola's 
personality. It doesn't intensity. look like it's yeah, the intensity. I, I mean, get, I get that from the manager. The question is, the players, the position they're in. Is it a challenge for them mentally? It, he'll change some of the players. I mean, Simon Mullock's very well connected, as you say, at, at Manchester City, and that was obviously looked a very well sourced piece. I'm slightly surprised to see Gabriel Jesus on the on the list when whenever he comes on, whenever he starts, he looks like, okay, he hasn't got Sergio Aguero sort of clinical finishing, but he's still young, he's still developing, he looks a player. But there are, you know, John Stones is a frustration for me because I think there's a fantastic footballer in there who I think can, I would definitely keep him. I think he was one of the I ones that Simon losing Mullock mentioned. Company with Losing company was big, but I also thought Delph as well for what he yeah. brought in the dressing room. If I was his personality, a, if I, yeah, his personality in the dressing room—you saw that come through in the in the footage. If I was a director of football yeah. at any other club, I would. But it's not—it's not a, it's not a crisis. Nobody said it was a crisis. Just said it was <laughs> challenging mentally for them. Yeah. Right, we're going to take our last break of the day right now. Make sure you stay with us. Welcome back to Sunday Supplement. Arsenal are improving somewhat under Mikel Arteta. They have now lost just one game in eight. Craig, what do you see that is going right for Arsenal right now? What, what have you seen in terms of the changes that have been made? Yeah, I mean, you, you look at the results and results haven't necessarily improved. I think that you mentioned that they've only won one match under Arteta. But there is a, a definite improvement in style, uh, in energy, in what they're trying to do in the final third. I said they've lost one. Lost one in eight. No, no, but they've also they've only won one league game under Arteta, haven't they? No, no. They're, they've drawn too many games. I agree with yeah. that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Somebody will tell me that surely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please, please check that. Yeah, but anyway. So yeah. So listen. Since he's came in, there has been uh, uh, an improvement. Just, just it goes back to what I said earlier about believing believe your eyes. Really, and there's a it's gone so stale under Emery to, towards the end. Then Arteta. Listen, he's not someone I've been exposed to massively. Uh, but you look at him, you listen to him. He's massively impressive. He really is. Listen, he's a he's a little mini pep, but that's not a not a bad role model to have. Really, you you, you do wonder if he works on the training ground, then goes in his office and works on his pepisms, really in the <laughs> mirror, and, and tries to mirror himself on, on Guardiola. But you know, if you're going to have any 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 role model, you might as well. Make you, sorry, you, you you can see the impact on the players. You can see his his belief. The Frank, fact that he's great, by the way, Henry. Yeah, one can, one league win. Yeah, can, very can good. we please get on the record? Yeah, yeah. yeah. one very league good. win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so sorry, Mike. And you, you can see his uh, his impact. OK, so maybe the results are, are going to take time, but the impact on discipline, the impact on Xhaka, you know, coming in and, and Xhaka has played pretty well. The tactical things that Arsenal fans have been crying out for, particularly in the tail end of the Emery era, Torreira playing his best position deep in front of the back four. The, the fact that he is giving these kids a chance. Willock, Saka at left back, turning Saka into left back. I don't think many Arsenal fans would have thought we can see Saka sort of coming through there. He's done well. He's addressed uh, the many defensive problems that Arsenal have had for sort of five or six years. Um, in, in this transfer window, Pablo Mari, Arsenal have been crying out for a left footed centre back just to sort of give that sort of complementary uh, balance as well. Cedric Suarez has come in. I mean, he's fortunate that Bellerin has, has come back into to form and fitness because he's, he's a terrific player. And there's a real buzz about Arsenal, which will be, I take your point about the sort of the wins, which will be reflected ultimately in results. He, Arteta is one of the most impressive young managers, I would say, in world football. I, in, so terms why, so of, sorry, in terms of his education under Pep, but also you just, if you followed his. His career and the captaincy, the, the football he had at Everton, he talks to people at Everton, he talks to people at Arsenal when he was a player there, they all said this is a manager in waiting because he's got so many strong ideas, because he is tough. There's a bit of sense of humour um, which comes out more in, in, in press conference, he's got that sort of slight wry side if a phone goes off or he's making a joke with a, with a journalist, but he is as hard as nails. Okay. And it was inside one final thing, right? there, there was an LMA do recently when Klopp and um, Guardiola, Guardiola were inducted into, you were there, Manchester, we're, we're, yeah, yeah, in Manchester, yeah. it was a brilliant event, the middle of the hotel, and they were inducted into the Hall of Fame, and it was interesting, when Arteta walked into the, sort of the, the drinks reception beforehand, so many of the other managers, so many of the other young coaches, they looked at him, they went and had a word, and this was before he even got the Arsenal job, he's left Manchester City at the right time in terms of, because he's ambitious, he's gone into Arsenal, he's exactly what they need. I don't think he particularly cares about being liked either. I think that was borne yeah. out as a player when he was at Arsenal. I think he was skipper, and there were moments where he had to he he, he had to address the, address the team. I don't think he particularly cared about being being Mr. Popular at mm -hmm. all. 
I think in terms of his background as well, being at Rangers would have would have helped, and having and then coming to to Everton, I think there is a steal about him. Mm. Um, and that win again, I say it's a win. It must have felt like a win, the Chelsea two-two, mm. because um, because the way they came back is something that I haven't seen in an Arsenal team in quite a while. Just a just a some real kind of steal there. He's got some and, good players. You look at you but, look at Martinelli and his use of and that's what's. From a, you know, going into Arsenal, you think, well, they, you know they've got some good young players, not all homegrown, but he is giving them a chance. That'll be the test uh, now Arsenal if not, he can keep if he can Are keep Arsenal not a bit like Manchester United? They've got some good players, but also got some that are just not good enough. I think they've got a better manager tactically. I'm talking mm. about the players. Well, Arsenal, Arsenal yeah. have got some terrific you, players. Yeah, you said about Manchester United. They've got I've, some good players, but yeah. some that aren't good enough. Are Arsenal similar for you? Uh, well, you look at that attack they've got. I mean, he's he's getting more of a tune out of uh, Pepe. He's got some kids that have have gone in there. I think where there are comparisons is central midfield, and I think Arteta has, has addressed that more. He's actually done it on the training ground in terms of Xhaka, in terms of Torreira. I think he's been and and Özil. I mean, Özil's tailed off slightly, but I thought when Arteta came in, he. Uh, Ozil was, was responding more because, as Mike says, they know that he's he'll ruthless and leave him out. I'm glad you mentioned the training ground. Craig, I was interested in what Mikel Arteta said on Friday ahead of today's mm. visit to Burnley. First of all, he said we mustn't be bullied by Burnley. And there are also reports today of Arsenal using tackle bags in training. Okay. <laughs> uh, listen, w w whatever works for you. What I like about Arteta is there's a, there's a real deep thinking intelligence there you know if he comes up with something like tackle bags f fair play to him in well it's Six Nations weekend isn't yeah it? and it goes back to what you said there about uh, Klopp and Guardiola uh, were you at the FWA dinner in Manchester in November where Klopp, mm. Klopp and Guardiola were on the same table and they both got up and gave magnificent speeches and you were sat there and you thought wow there's two guys who've got the charisma to hold a room you can only imagine what it's like in a dressing room and I went out to see Thierry Henry last week in, uh, in Orlando he's the new manager of Montreal Impact and we mm. sat down and it's this and Thierry's very intense and he, and he mm. talks a lot and he's very serious but the one thing he said which he's realised is the modern player will challenge you on everything you have got to be clever enough as an individual as a manager to be their dad their uncle their brother their friend and know when to do it and for me Guardiola and Klopp have got that and I look at Mikel Arteta mm. and I think he probably has got that emotional intelligence to to walk into a dressing room and know exactly what what players need I still think he'll Quickly realise about the dressing room and who are, and that he needs character. I think since he left, I think that's the the characters in that squad have it's become weaker and weaker in turn, and even even more so when they lose the likes of Ramsey. So I think that that will be his big challenge, as well as keeping um, Lacassette and Pierre Emerick uh, of Amiens at the club because they're big assets. We were talking earlier about strikers. And, and everybody in Europe wants wants these people like those players that he has. So I think where they are on the table now, 12th won't be good enough for those players who who want to be playing prim, um, Champions League football. But give him time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, give, give him time and a couple of transfer windows. The, the good kids they've got coming through. But he is already making players better. You can see that. Mm. You, you mentioned there that you talked about who had a better squad: Manchester United, Arsenal, or, or you can throw Spurs in there as well. The the tradition, four of the traditional top six have fallen away, we can all agree. Chelsea, Spurs, Man U and Arsenal. Now, which of those four, in two years' time, would you back to be in the, in the best position in terms of, would you base it entirely on the manager? Yes, on what basis would you back them? Manager or structure? Manager, structure, slash current squad in, in so the, basis, on, the basis from which they're working from. Of those four? Chelsea and Arsenal based on the two managers they've got in. I think Frank's just so erudite. I think he's believable. I think he's going to be a top, top manager. I think they've got the, the, the core of a, a wonderful young British squad there. Uh, and Arsenal, based on everything I've just said about Arteta, I, I don't see well, where they're going. On who you. would progress to yeah. so. Well, I, I, I like the look of, of, of Leicester and what they're, what they're doing, and, and more so than Arsenal, actually. I know mm. I, you guys know Arteta more than I do. Henry? Uh, Leicester, they have strengths in all departments, from uh, dugout to boardroom to uh, academy to recruitment. Second club? Arteta. I but purely because of Arteta. They've got issues with the owners, but Arteta is... He will the drag them all up. Yeah. OK. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your company. Thoroughly entertaining, as always.